Thank you, guys. Hey, everybody. Rich. Hi, I'm Sam. So uh, great to see you. Uh, you know, it's so funny when when we got asked to do the speaker series, um, we started talking about like what we wanted to talk about. And, and one of the things that was asked was, how did we get to where we are? Mm -hmm. and, and 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 where we started taking the, the conversations, even though we've worked together for a long time, there's certain parts of our careers that I don't know about Sam and Sam probably doesn't know about me because we don't really talk about the past that much. You know, we always talk about where we're going, the future and things like that. So what we thought we'd do is we, we actually wrote a series of questions and we put them in this hat. <laughs> and, and so we figured we would randomly pick some, um, some questions out of the hat, ask questions of each other um, and go from there. And then if, if anytime you have a question, please just throw it into the chat and, and we'll, we'll read it here or we'll call on you to, uh, to ask the question um, and we'll go from there. It's going to be exciting, like live TV, guys. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what Sam's <laughs> going to ask me. I mean, I have no idea where, the, where this is going to go. So this could either be great or it could be an enormous <laughs> failure. So, uh, so we'll go from there. So Awesome. All right, let's go. All right. Here's the ladies first. All right. Meaning, yeah. all right. Okay. Okay. Oh, I got a little one. Okay. <laughs> okay. When did you know that you were going to work in advertising? Wow. Okay. So this is actually kind of crazy. Uh, a little bit of a crazy story. Um, you know, I was never like one of those kids growing up who was like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor or a veterinarian or a ballerina or like whatever kids say when they're when they're growing up. But I always loved art. I'm an art director um, by trade. So I always loved being creative and doing things like that. But I really never had a recollection of knowing what I wanted to do when I grew up. And then a few years back, funny enough, um, my parents were moving out of our, my childhood home and I was helping them move out and clean everything out. And like a lot of parents do, you know, box, my, we were going through boxes and my mom had saved a lot of stuff from my childhood, like report cards and things like that. And so we're going through and she's like, do you want any of this? And we're weeding everything out. And lo and behold, right there, I kid you not, you guys, there's um, like a bifold little like what you do in second grade, right? You write like little reports and things like that. And the question was, or the assignment was, what do you want to be when you grow up? Write it, write a story about it and illustrate it. And it was all about being a sign maker, which is kind of interesting <laughs> because it's, it's essentially commercial art, right? It's what I do. Um, so in second grade, I guess I had some sort of foresight that this is the direction I'd be going in. Cool. So. All right. Oh, I supposed to answer yeah, some questions. I was gonna um, so I had no idea I was going into advertising. I, I went to college. I was, I, I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. Um, I, I got a journalism degree um, and fresh out of college, I, I got a, a job at a newspaper and I hated it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I mean, I was there for a few months and, and I absolutely hated it. And partially because everyone who was in the newsroom at the time hated their job. Uh -huh. They were like, yeah, it's a dying industry kid. Get out. <laughs> you know, all these grizzly old veterans. <laughs> and, and I had no other skills but to be a writer. Um, and so I, I met a friend of mine who was an art director in an advertising agency. Um, went there, met the people there, thought they were really cool and started working in advertising. I, I was one of those people. I never took a single advertising class in college. I didn't know anything about advertising. I was very, very fortunate to learn it on the job. Yeah, I was so, going to say, I mean, even though I studied graphic design, it wasn't an advertising track like they have now. Um, as a matter of fact, the very first ad that I ever wrote, like I look back on it now, I wrote it like a newspaper article. It had super long copy and under the photograph, um, I actually wrote a caption mm -hmm. under the photograph like you would in a newspaper article. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, that's so, so funny. Anyway. And if you guys don't know, Mr. Can you hear me now, Verizon? This guy yeah. right here. 
<laughs> I, right. love, I so, love that. Okay. All right, so now I, I'm going to yeah, pick yeah, one, you pick. and then you, and you can answer first. Ooh, a long one. Ooh. Okay. I think that this is a question a lot of people come up against at some point in their career, Rich. Okay. All right. So regardless of level, we've all been here. It's the 11th hour and either the creative just isn't cracked or someone comes in and blows up the work and you know that that deadline is tomorrow or the next day. What do you do? How do you tackle that? I think when the work just isn't there, I usually go all the way back to the brief. Mm -hmm. Because for some reason, there's either something in the brief that wasn't resonating, so you didn't yeah. feel it, or it was there are too many ways to go. Mm -hmm. Like you, sometimes you you look at a creative you, at a creative brief and it's like, well, maybe I'll tackle this part of it, or I'll tackle mm -hmm. that part of it, where it's it wasn't coming together into a single-minded idea. Mm -hmm. So when the work isn't there, I always go back to the brief and ask myself why, mm -hmm. and then. Usually what I will do is if I can't change the brief, which now I can, but, <laughs> but if I couldn't change, if I wasn't at that point in my career where I couldn't change the brief, um, I would take parts of it. I I'd take the mm -hmm. brief apart and say, okay, this is a direction or mm -hmm. this is a direction or this is a direction. And I'd attack them all. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I'm fairly relentless when it comes to creativity. Um, and, and I think that um, I'll, I'll go back and I'll make sure that there wasn't something in an early round that mm -hmm. ended up on the cutting mm -hmm. room floor or there wasn't a nugget of something buried inside of something else that could be uh, the winning yeah. idea. And so yeah. many times you see that where you discard an mm -hmm. idea because it's too complex or it's not communicating exactly right or a lot of other things, but mm -hmm. buried deep in there mm -hmm. was a really simple single-minded idea. And if you pull that one part out, maybe that's the big yeah, idea. Yeah, I had a team that for, for years, you I finally figured out, look at their taglines because yeah. the tagline actually ended up being their idea, but yeah. they got overlooked a lot of times and, and on the cutting room floor. Yeah, so. how about you? Um, so I think similar things, but I think, um, one of the kind of lessons I learned along the way, I think when you're scrambling 11th hour, like let's say the client blows something up or the team missed something along the way, it, it, it happens, right? I think there can be almost a moment in time where the team wants to dissect, how did we get here? And I think one of the most important things is keeping your eye on the finish line. Like, what do we have to do to cross the finish line? We can dissect all of that later where things went wrong, but what am I going to do to make sure that we cross the finish line and cross it strong? So I'm usually rolling up my sleeves. I'll get right in there. Who's my go-to team that can help like push this right across the finish line? What do we need to do, um, you know, can we scale back a little bit so that we can really deliver something great? Like really assessing what are the immediate next steps that we need to take to cross the finish line as strong as possible? Well, I, I think there's also another really important thing is that there's no right number of concepts yeah. to bring into, an, into a review, right? Sometimes people go, oh, we need four, we need three, we need six, we need yeah. We need 10, we need to go with it. Like I've, I've had incredibly successful meetings where I've brought in one mm -hmm. concept. I've had incredibly successful meetings where I've brought in four or five. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't like bringing in many more than that um, only because it's very, very difficult to focus the yeah. conversation after the presentation um, if there are too many. Yeah. I found um, that two five tends to be yeah, kind of the kind of, threshold. And, and, and so I think the other thing about the 11th hour is that you think, oh my God, I have to do so many. Mm -hmm. And and that sort of stops you from from from, from doing one. Yep. And and there have been many times where I will have a very honest conversation with a client beforehand. I'll call and say, hey, look, you know, we're working on this. We haven't quite cracked it yet. Mm -hmm. 
but we have one that we absolutely love. And they always say, well, let's see that one. Yeah, yeah. So that's all right. great. I all right, pick. you get to pick. Ooh, this is a really big one. Ooh. Three lines, four lines. <laughs> okay. That's me. That's the art director. The copywriter writes it. Next. It's the it. same. I write things very <laughs> verbose. If you weren't doing this as your career, what do you think you'd be doing instead? Okay. P.S. This isn't one of those, if you want a trillion dollars, what would you do? Or if you could do anything and not have to worry about money, what would you do? This is, you need to make a viable living <laughs> in something other than advertising. What would it be? I put a lot of rules and conditions on that okay. question. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'm glad you have to answer this. Um, so I would want to, I, I think I would want to do something creative, but you know, my, my go-to outside of advertising would be like painting or something like that. And that's more of the trillion dollar win the lottery scenario. The other thing that I really love doing, um, I taught college classes for a period of time. I loved teaching. So I, I would probably pursue something like that. Or um, I really love finding great talent, bringing them into like recruiting and mentorship and coaching. Um, I really like a lot. So I'd probably do something in that world. Yeah, I, I, likewise, um, I, I spent time teaching. I taught at FIT, SVA, Syracuse mm -hmm. University. Um, I would probably become a full-time teacher. Yeah. Yeah, because um, I really enjoy it. Um, ironically, I have people who work for me who, mm -hmm. who I were my students. Um, so I, 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 I like teaching people and then I like finding incredible yeah. talent. Yeah. Um, I'd probably be a pretty good headhunter too. Yeah. Well, you know? see, we can know. start Maybe a business yeah. together. We'll <laughs> okay. All right. No. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And okay. don't forget, if you have questions, just type them. Yeah. Add your own questions too, guys. Okay. Oh, well, we kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, what do you think are the ingredients of an exceptional creative brief? Not just good, exceptional. An exceptional creative brief. Um, I, what I love about creative briefs, when they, when you see them, you feel it, and your mm -hmm. first thing that comes to mind is that can't possibly be true. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. There's there's an injustice in the world that is so bad mm -hmm. and you feel it so deeply that you're like, that can't possibly be true. Mm -hmm. And thank God someone has created something to help that. Mm -hmm. You know? Um and and I know those are the briefs when I see them, I immediately um the part of my personality that wants to help and wants to make a difference in the yeah. world comes out and I get really fired up and I'm like, you know, F this. And I, like, yeah. I, I get really angry. You have to angry. do something you about it. do something about it. I get so angry yeah. that um, I want to channel all of my energy and all of my creativity in solving the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I go into huge, like, all right, what are we going to do? Um, and, and awareness mm -hmm. of the problem isn't enough. Mm -hmm. It's people taking action to solve the problem is what. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a great creative brief for me makes me feel something deeply, incites me to action, and usually has a big uh, global giant problem mm -hmm. that needs to be fixed. Yeah, that's some great. injustice in the world. We have a couple. Let me just see if oh. there's something. Um, OK, we'll we'll circle back okay. to those questions in a second. Um, I completely agree with you, Rich. I, I think when you have um, a really incredible insight, um, and I, I think the ones that are most interesting for me are when there's an intersection of a situation that's happening and a cultural moment. So like we work in healthcare advertising, right? And, and health and wellness space. And so a lot of the injustices that Rich is talking about are often centered around a certain condition or a therapeutic area or people who um, are being overlooked for, for treatment options, when those intersect with a major cultural moment, there's something that's like extra special that, that I think emerges from that. Um, 
But I think that there are two other really important ingredients, yep. clarity and brevity. <laughs> well, well, they're not called briefs for no or, reason. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Right? Yeah, I'm sure we've all come across the like 10 page brief before right. and you're like, what is this? Um, just fill it down. But there's an art form to getting yeah. to a great brief. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's why when when we get stuck, I always go back to the brief. Yep. Right. Because in there is 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 the is the key, mm -hmm. right? And our jobs as creative is to unlock it. Yeah. Right. I want to ask you actually a follow-up question okay. on this because I think this happens all the time too. Yep. We come up internally as an agency with a fantastic brief. The creatives are super excited about it. It goes in front of the clients and it gets massacred. And we end up with a brief that is like, oh man, what are we going to do with this? There's nothing exceptional about this brief anymore. What do you do? I, I, I think that's when you, when you like doubly focus yeah, on yeah. the brief, mm -hmm. right? Because again, in, the, in whatever they've created, there's something in there. And or it's usually the reason why they created the product, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Somewhere, somewhere in that in that organization, someone had an idea to create a problem, to solve a problem mm -hmm. by creating this product, and that they know it so well and so intimately yep. that they can't see that they're talking to themselves. Mm -hmm. So finding that nugget and then showing them the path, how to get from here to there, yep. is what I try to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So we're going to jump to you guys. So Stephanie um, had the first question. So Stephanie, do you want to come on and ask a question? If not, we'll just read it for you. <laughs> I can ask it. Don't worry. Um, yeah, it, it's more about, you know, in the, in the early years of your career, maybe like the first decade, mm -hmm. you find that uh, a lot of, did you get any opportunities from people that you know, or was it always just you, you know, hustling and getting yourselves there? Or did you did you make connections and then those connections helped you to get further? A great question. And hello, Menti. It's good to see you again. Um, I think, you know, for me, I think it's a combination of both. I think when you find um, someone in your career who really inspires you, who um, will lend you that or give you that extra time, that 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 time to just say, hey, can I grab 30 minutes? I want to like run something past you. I want your, your opinion. Take hold of that. Like that is a gift. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's some of that in building those types of relationships. And I have a number of those that still to, to this day, you know, decades later, I'm still um, in contact with those folks. But I've always been, I've been, I, I love that you use the word hustler because I feel like that's what I've always been. It's kind of like, all right, where's something new that's going on that I don't know about? Let me go check that out. Let me ask somebody if they'll be my informal mentor in, in that area. You know, when I was, when I was kind of coming up in the industry, digital was what was really blowing up back then. And trying to understand how to make a great idea come to life digitally, there was a big, big learning curve for a lot of art directors. So I found a tech lead and I said, hey, will you have coffee with me like once a month? And I just come prepared with a ton of questions for him. Um, and, and all things that were just gonna make me be better at my job, make me better at working with my team. So I think I think it's really a combination of both personally, but what about you, Rich? Yeah, uh, in the very, very beginning of my career, I had several mentors who were just invaluable. Mm -hmm. I mean, they taught me so much about the craft of copywriting, the craft of ideation. Um, I, I, I had a creative director who pounded into my head every time I would show him an idea um, that I actually had an execution and not an idea. Mm. And, and he would say, what's the idea? What's the idea? And I would try to explain to him, nope, that's the execution. What is the idea behind that? What's, what's the insight yep. that you're bringing to it? What's new? What's different? And, and I think that, that those early mentors mm -hmm. were, were everything because mm -hmm. they, they set the foundation. And then from there, I was sort of on that little trajectory where I followed certain categories. 
uh, I, as an example, for very early in my career, I only worked on beverages. I worked on beer for a long time, and then I went from beer to soft drinks, and then I went from soft, you know, mm -hmm. so I just followed categories that I, I was good at, that I was enjoying, and things like that. So, you know, there are certain categories that you can work in, and or certain therapeutic areas that you can work in, or you can work with certain people. Mm -hmm. and, and I and I find that early in my career, I did a lot of following people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. I think you know one other thing that might be a little bit embedded in that in that question to um, Stephanie, if I'm reading it correctly, because I'm I'm looking up at our board, and I think it's a little bit too about you know advancing in your careers as as well. And I think one of the things that I say to a lot of my younger creatives is chase the opportunities, chase the places where it will push you, where you will find new opportunities to grow and expand. I think it's easy in our world to chase a paycheck or to chase a title or something like that, but chase the opportunities that get you excited and you will never, ever go wrong. Thank you. Uh, Erica, you have a you have a, sort of two questions. I do. Yeah, I do have two questions. Okay, so you get a really tough brief. Mm -hmm. um, how how do you guys start your process of trying to crack it and and find those places of of inspiration? And then even when you're doing blue, so that's part one. The second part is when you're doing blue sky thinking, and you know maybe there's a challenge to come up with some some idea on your own time where do you go is it just when you encounter that insight so it's twofold how do you how do you tackle a really challenge you know that brief and get your idea and then when you're trying to come up with those big out of the box ideas mm -hmm. do you have a tried and true process I, I, I do you do I do yeah uh, uh I dig into the research yeah and, and and what I mean by that is I will read everything I will look at everything. I will watch as many videos as I can. I I, I dig deep into the information. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that, somehow my brain synthesizes the information. Yeah. Um, and when it doesn't do it naturally, I have this bizarre post-it note exercise that I do. I mean, you'll, I mean, on my wall, I always have like lots of post-it notes. And what I do is I will think about the product or device or service or whatever, and I will write on a post-it note one thing um, and only one, like one word or one small phrase on a post-it note. And I'll try to go through an entire packet of post-it notes. So I'll have several hundred post-it notes on the wall. And then I won't look at the wall mm -hmm. and I'll pull four post-it notes off the wall and I'll put them together and I'll look at those four things that I wrote, which all have something to do with this product service. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll look at those four and then I'll try to write a story that connects those four. And usually that story um, will get me to a place because what I do is after I write the story, I give the story a title. Mm -hmm. um, and the title of that story usually ends up being a a bucket of work to to explore. So that's a that's a problem. When I'm when I'm really stuck, that's my go-to. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. Um, I tend to like my first thing is to just free associate. I just let whatever is in my mind, write it all down on paper, and just kind of get everything out. First reactions, first impressions, first thoughts, even if it feels completely out of left field. And then similar to Rich, I just start really researching if it's especially if it's a tough brief I think that was part of the first part of your question Erica I'll try to find some really interesting insight around whatever the situation at hand is something that gives me a little something to sink my teeth into that feels like there's momentum or excitement behind it and then kind of ideate off of that the other thing as I'm looking at at, at stuff and kind of getting deep into um the research I mentioned before that intersection of a situation or an injustice and a cultural moment, I think is really powerful. So for example, um, there's been a lot of stuff right now about 
um, things that are happening behaviorally because of social media, right? That's a cultural moment that can intersect with, again, in our world, a health and wellness situation, right? How do those two things feed one another? Or, um, you know, uh, media consumption habits are a great place to go to, like, where are these people spending their time? What are they doing? Oh, there may be a hobby or an interest that intersects in a really interesting way. So looking for those intersection points. Um, and then, you know, I think sometimes too, one of the things, it, it's more in the background, but just being a constant student of work, of great yeah. advertising, it sits in the back of your brain. And I think it starts fostering some really interesting connections over time. It fuels you along the way, bits and pieces um, will start coming together. Um, so there's that. And then I, I also read like Wired Magazine, like a junkie, like I'm always looking for new technology things that are happening or coming out too. So for blue sky ideas, um, I, I think I said it earlier, mm -hmm. I always look for something that when I see it or read it or hear it, I say, that can't be true. Mm -hmm. That can't possibly be true. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you, Ryan, and Ollie came to me um, with the idea that became Life Saving Radio, yep. right? That yep. idea. Um, the first thing you said was, oh, they did this clinical trial um, to see what music, when surgeons are in the surgical suites, they listen to music. And guess what music was the best for surgical ac accuracy? And I, I would have guessed all day long. I never would have said ACDC, AC yeah. right? And when and when I heard that, I'm like, that can't possibly mm -hmm. be true. Mm -hmm. And it was such a, it became such an interesting moment because then creating an idea for that um, became just so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so anyway, yeah, yeah. For those of you who aren't in the healthcare space, um, we the project that Rich is referencing is, is something that we just worked on this past year called Life Saving Radio. And the insight was that ACDC music makes surgeons um, more efficient, more precise, and more effective in the operating room. Um, so it really actually improves surgical outcomes, which to Rich's point is just crazy. All right. He's reading the board. So, He's so getting I, yeah, sorry, I, I, so um, Ramon Alder, you have a question. Yes, hi, nice to meet you. Hi, um, I have a question, especially for the healthcare area you're working in. So what, what do you think is because, yeah, it's a stupid word, but normal agency and healthcare marketing agency. What do you think is the big difference between healthcare marketing, pharma medicine, all this kind of uh, mm. topics to normal, yeah, yeah. creative agency? Oh, yeah, yeah. we get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get this question. <laughs> All Every day of the week. Yeah. So, so, so here, here's what I'd say: the the process of creating work is exactly the mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. There's no difference, right? You work with a partner, you work with teams, you come up with crazy ideas, you throw pencils into the ceiling, you do all the exact same stuff, mm -hmm. right? The big difference between healthcare and non-healthcare advertising is, for me, mm -hmm. is that in normal non-healthcare advertising, you're always looking for a reason for people to pay attention, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, and sometimes you, you're you making stuff up to make people care mm -hmm. or to make people pay attention or to have people lean in and all of those things. In healthcare advertising, it's there already. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to die mm -hmm. or someone's going to live, have a crappy um, quality of life. I mean, the reason to pay attention is already there. Yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to dramatize something because the drama is already there. All you need to do is make people aware, make people take action, do all of those things by telling them that you have an answer to a problem that they have. And and in healthcare advertising, just making people aware is it nearly enough. Mm -hmm. You have to actually provoke them to to take an action mm -hmm. um and, and to actually do something about it because if you have a a health issue just knowing you have it mm -hmm. you know that's part of it but then taking that next step and doing something about it is what will have you live a better more productive life 
So I think that's the big difference. Mm -hmm. You don't have to create the drama, the drama is already there. Yeah. I think too, um, a lot, I, I think a lot about this, this too, because I, I started outside of the healthcare space as did Rich. Um, and for me in a lot of ways, look, especially with it, I think in a lot of ways, outside of health and wellness, we're really, at the end of the day, you're really trying to sell more products, right? You're trying to sell product. I, it, I'd, I'd be lying if I were to say that there aren't products attached to a lot of the stuff that we do, but our modus operandi, if you will, is not to sell the product. It's to help people. Yeah. It's to change their lives. It's to get important information in the hands of people who need it most. So we always have to lead with that. The need to be deeply connected to the human experience and deeply connected to um, authentic, meaningful relationships that try to understand and, and empathize with wherever somebody is in their health and wellness journey becomes the most important thing. If you can do that, all of the rest follows. Yeah. And I think that's a bit different than, you know, selling um, Adidas or a new computer or something like that, right? Um, all also awesome. That was like not a diss by any means, but it's a different, it's a different way at the marketing challenge. I, I also think you see mainstream advertising brands doing much more altruistic or healthcare related projects, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, this year we saw um uh, you know beer brands going and, and fishing plastic out of the water, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, so you see lots of brands, you know, we saw, um, I think it was Dell or Intel doing things about voice banking, mm -hmm. right? Which is for all people who are right to, right, to lose their, use the ability to speak. So I think even mainstream brands are seeing that instead of inventing a reason to believe, that by attaching themselves to important health initiatives mm -hmm. and health and healthcare topics, that they can become more top of mind. So, um, Javier, if you have a question. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, yeah. perfectly. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yes, my question is about when you 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 recently will was uh, have spoken, you know, about this point, the brief, the part on the what is mm -hmm. the brief. But sometimes here, at least in Chile, where I work, we don't have a good a, a good brief behind. You know, sometimes you have a, a a really bad month without some work to or brief to inspire you. So what we do here is try to find uh, the context or maybe uh, create our own brief to get a good idea. Because mm -hmm. I guess you know all that we are here, uh, we work a lot to get at least one good idea to to. To get I don't know an aware, yeah. etc. So when you don't have a good brief, what is the brief that you create? Or if you do that, maybe you 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 can say me, uh, uh, we don't need to create a brief. You have to work with the brief that you have and to try to find the inspiration behind that. So it is a question that I really would like to you know to listen to your answer because it's something that really happens here. You you, you know it's. <sighs> It's a double-edged sword, right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is there are many times in our day-to-day -day existence where we say the clients are using the work to find their path, yep. right? They don't know where they want to go. Um, so no matter what creative brief you create, sometimes, there are clients who only know it when they see it. Mm -hmm. So, so there are times where we create work that maybe is on brief or slightly adjacent to the brief mm -hmm. or around the brief, or sometimes maybe even completely off brief, but it, it solves the problem in a different way because we're using the work to help get us to at least alignment mm -hmm. on where we should continue to explore. That is a very tough way to work. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I will tell you that is not the optimal way to work because you almost get a good idea by accident. I call it throwing darts on yeah. a dartboard in the dark and hoping that you get a bullseye. <laughs> yeah. So so you you just don't know. Mm -hmm. And and if you're going to work that way, it is really time consuming, really expensive from an agency point of view. Mm -hmm. Um and more times than not, you're going to throw 95% of the work that you create away. Because what's happening is you're you're just wandering. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, you may find your way. And maybe once or twice in your career, you were really lucky and hit on something amazing without knowing where you were going. But I can tell yeah. you, 95% of the time, you just lost. I just had this happen with one of our current clients on my on my team. And um, oh no, it never happens here. <laughs> it never <laughs> happens here. <laughs> never happens here. Um, but you know, I, I think you bring up a great point because it does happen all the time. It doesn't matter, I think, what sector you work in, but you'll have a client who's trying to solve their strategy through the work, right? And even if you have a creative brief, even if you have a big strategy, a positioning statement, all, all of the hallmarks of a strategic foundation. Um, they can still be using the work to iron out some of those details. And so after a couple of rounds of really great work that we put in front of these clients, I said, time out, like, let's get on a call with the clients and have a very honest conversation. Let's go back to the brief and say, is this still true to you? Do we need to go back to square one for a second and rethink where we're going with our strategy. Everything here is completely on brief. Um, but if you guys are heading in another direction, that's fine, but we need to align on it to make sure that we can we can cross the finish line strong. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so no new questions for the moment. Let me ask you another question. All right. All right, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This really has nothing to do with work. <laughs> we threw some fun ones into the mix. I'm curious what one I'm going to get. What are you binge watching right now? Oh, Yellow Jackets. Yellow Jackets. I'm obsessed with Yellow Jackets. I love it. The storytelling. I I don't know if you guys know. I'll give you a quick premise if, if you don't know the show um, without giving it away. But basically, there's a girls soccer team in the 90s in New Jersey, which is where I'm from and where I grew up, um, who is... Uh, traveling to a tournament, national tournament, right? So they all hop on a plane together. The plane goes down and for years they have to figure out how to survive in the wilderness wow. together. And then fast forward to modern day, they're all grown up. They're, a lot of them are married, family, kids, and the past just keeps coming up. And what I love about it is so many things. The storytelling is fantastic. Um, but the music is the music of my generation, which yeah. I love. I see all of these reference, he see and hear all of these references that are very local to me. So there's a sense of nostalgia that's really fun cool. to it as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm obsessed at the moment. Cool. How about you? I went down a very deep rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know why I did this, but um, I started watching Suits um, because oh, I, yeah. I was curious about Meghan Markle. Mm -hmm, I was mm -hmm. like, I wonder, was she good, a good actor or not? Like, could she actually act? Yeah, could she actually <laughs> act? Uh, and, and so I watched the first few episodes of Suits and I really enjoyed it. And yes, Meghan Markle is actually quite good in it. Um, so now I didn't realize it was it's, it has nine seasons. Wow. At, of like 15 episodes a season. So I'm now in the middle of season five and I started two weeks ago. That's amazing. So I'm, you know, there's I'm a, actually a great commercial that Meghan Markle's in. My husband oh, and I, what? it's like one of our favorites. It's an old Bud Light commercial. She plays a bartender That's and this funny. guy walks up to the bar in skinny jeans and he walks really funny, asks for a Bud Light and she's like, what are you doing? He said, I'm wearing skinny jeans. They're kind of in right now. And she's like, no, they're no, no, not. No. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. All right. Another one. Am and Rich, uh, Shahid has a question in this group. Oh, sure. Hey, Shahid. Shahid, are you there? 
What if Shahid uh, hang on. Perfect. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Nice uh, hi, Islam. Hey, nice to see both of you. Hi, Sam. Hi, Rich. You um, too. How's it going? I'm hey, all right. <laughs> yeah, good. So I can't turn my video on for some reason, but anyway, you can hear me. Yes. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure you've never, both of you have never made a mistake in your life. But my question is, if you had, what is your best mistake? Oh, gosh, what a great question. What is my best mistake? Mm. Yeah. That's a great question. It's a really great question. I think my best mistake, um, very early in my career, I had the opportunity to um, work for, uh, for another agency. I had a job offer. And I, I, it was at a really great agency on great brands. And, and at the 11th hour, I decided not to take the job mm. and to take a different job mm -hmm. instead. Um, and for the short term, it was a huge mistake mm. that the, the other brands were doing much better work. And I would have probably had a faster career trajectory mm -hmm. at the first agency and the second agency I was I, I was struggling it was struggling um I was working on work that wasn't so glamorous um but it turned into something better and better and better and the people that I met at agency number two became lifelong friends the work that I did at agency number two ended up being the best work of my entire career up until that point um, so what seemed like a gigantic mistake at the time turned out to be, you know, a really great blessing. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's probably the best mistake I made because it turned out to not be a mistake. Yeah. At the yeah. End. yeah. Well, it's funny because I actually, I love that question so much because I actually don't really believe in mistakes. I, I think it's only a mistake if you don't learn from that experience. Um, mine's actually kind of similar to yours, just in terms of um, uh, oh, job hunting, job searching, and like the whole kind of you know where you go next. Um, I had uh, I had taken a job that was a really bad fit for me, um, and I kind of felt it going in. It was at the peak of the dot com era, and the bubble exploded, and so a, a lot of agencies, a lot of even creative boutique shops. They were laying people off left and right. Um, I had just moved back to the East Coast. And so I was out there pounding the pavement, trying to make connections here now, um, which, you know, I didn't really have. All my connections were back out East, uh, on the West Coast, rather. And um, I took the first job that came to me. And it was um, inside the user experience group for Credit Suisse First Boston. And I came from a really cool mom and pop boutique brand experience agency on the West Coast. You know, you could show up with pink hair and tattoos and whatever. And like, they love that to corporate investment banking, right? Like you couldn't be more in a square box. And, um, and, and I took it out of fear. I took it out of fear at that time, but I knew in my gut, it wasn't a great match. And in hindsight, I, I, I think I stayed there just shy of a year. In hindsight, I am really glad that I took it. I call it business boot camp. It was my business boot camp year mm -hmm. um, because that is a corporate driven, like very political, not very creative type of environment. There was a lot of sexism there going on. There were a ton of politics. Um, so I kind of learned that side of just survival in kind of your career, right? Like some of those really valuable lessons that no matter what what path you were going to go on um, ended up becoming really, really important. And so that set me on a whole different trajectory after that and really made me kind of step away saying from here on out, 
I'm going to wait for the right fit. I'm going to make sure that this feels like the right place and the right time for me in my career journey. Um, Frank had a question about presentation. Types. Yeah, uh, given that the work is done and the idea is great, do you have any presentation tips to ensure or increase the chances for your clients to buy into the work? Yeah, it's so funny. We actually have a similar question in our in our hat that we drafted. It's funny, you know, we um, we talk a lot as creators about the work and my getting the work ready for for the presentation itself. But what I love about your question is a lot of times we don't take a step back to talk about how are we going to sell this in? How are we bringing this idea to the client? How are we packaging this up? Um, and it's so important because it's not a one size fits all, right? A lot of times we'll go in with a key visual and a core idea description, or maybe, you know, a rough kind of script or storyboard. But just this earlier this spring, I had um, a leadership offsite for my team, and we spoke a lot about this. And we, we were looking at a lot of different pieces of work and almost like reverse engineering what the cell was and how different it would have to be to get certain pieces of work through. So for example, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar um, with this piece called Save Ralph. It's um, for the, in, I think, International Humane Society and it's an animated rabbit who's a test rabbit and it's it's basically a PSA for why you know animals shouldn't be tested on it's all CGI it's all animated there's a bit of humor and levity to it and the reason why we spoke about that is because they said could you imagine walking into the client meeting with just a plain storyboard of this and saying yeah we're going to do a cartoon a 3D cartoon, CGI cartoon that has a lot of humor where we personify your lab animals and have them tell their horrific experience. Like that would just fall flat. So how do you package that up? How do you get, I think the question has to be, how do you get in the mind of your client that allows them to connect with the vision that we see, right? As creatives, I think a lot of times even if it's not our idea, we can look at something in its infancy and see the potential of where it can go. A lot of times our clients can't do that. So how do you give them almost a lived sense of, of what the final product is gonna be? And it's gonna be different for different projects and interactive projects gonna be different than a film-based project, different than a print ad, et cetera. So I think really thinking about how you package it up to yeah. give them a flavor of, of where it'll go. What yeah. do you think? Yes, yeah. I tend to take people behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is clients can't do what we do. They can't, they don't have that little weird thing in their brain that lets them see things that nobody else has ever seen. Yeah. So, so many times when I feel really passionately about an idea, um, I'll take clients behind the curtain mm -hmm. where I was when the inspiration first hit, what I was reading, mm -hmm. what piece of data or what information sparked the idea. And I'll take them along the path mm -hmm. of, the, of the creation of the idea and how it answers their problem, their business problem, their strategic problem, their, their whatever problem. Um, and so I, I find that to be very effective. And when I'm not selling, but I'm storytelling, right. um, it's when I'm usually the most effective and clients are the most re receptive because I'm not asking them to buy something. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm asking them to like a story that I'm telling. And, 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 you know, a lot of times I'll start the conversations with, have you ever been in a situation where you are the dumbest person in the room? <laughs> and everyone goes like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's how people with blank feel. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, or like, I'll start with something incredibly re relatable. Um, and then I'll go from there. So. That's my little thing. <laughs>
Um, Anne Great Marie question. Amandi. Anne Marie. Anne Marie, are you? Yes, I am. Hi, hi guys. Hi. hi. So I wanted to know from you, because um, you have so many years of experience, would you consider this um, point of your career, this roles that you currently have, the ultimate roles, or do you still have plans of growing in your space? Are you looking to go to different uh, industries, perhaps trying out uh, something different from healthcare? Thank you. Yeah, you want to go first? You can go first. Okay. Um, yeah, it's actually funny. We also had a similar question to this. You know, I think for me at, at this point in my career, I, I've done I've done all of the levels, and for me, it's it's more about again chasing the experience, chasing the opportunity. It's more about less about the title and more about the people I'm going to work with, the people I'm going to collaborate with, being surrounded by brilliant minds, being in an agency like this agency, which is absolutely exceptional, um, that supports ideas that, um, you know, just, uh, it, it, it just vibrates with a sense of possibility and, and allowing you to be entrepreneurial and and really pursue what it is that you're passionate about and to me that's the most important thing I kind of don't even care about the title anymore I just want to make amazing work with amazing people so I, I, <laughs> so I describe my role mostly as the remover of obstacles mm -hmm. and, and and what do I mean by that is I want to do the greatest work in the industry. And, and there along the way, there will become obstacles that get in the way, yeah. no matter what they could be. It could be internal, it could be external, it could be financial, it could be press. It could, there, there's all of these obstacles along the way. And my job is to clear the path mm -hmm. so you can do the best possible work there is in the world. Um, and, and, and for me, um, I think I'm not, I don't think of my, my job as a destination for myself any longer. Mm -hmm. I, I've actually stopped thinking about that a while ago. Yeah. Um, my job is, is now setting up other people mm -hmm. and having other people get to where they want in their career. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it it stopped it stopped being about me a long time ago. I, yeah. I've really stopped thinking about my own career. And and what's ironic is when you do that and when you start thinking about other people and and having them do exceptional work, um, it it makes you feel so amazing and mm -hmm. it lifts you even more anyway. So yep. um be great. Beatrice. Hi Sam, hi Rich. Um, I have a quick question. Um, when you were younger, how did you know when it was time to maybe leave the agency and leave your job and find a new position and a new challenge? I think my main question is, when do you know if you're just becoming good at your job or you're just becoming comfortable and maybe too comfortable and then not really developing? We were just having that conversation. Yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy. So, so first of all, how's everything in Copenhagen? It's great, but it's not in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sad, but <laughs> so, so I may be unusual in this regard is that I I think that when I feel like I've stopped learning, yeah, is when I tend to get itchy and start thinking about new opportunities. So as long as I'm learning. I, I tend to want to keep learning, mm -hmm. but when I feel like I've stopped learning, you know, something clicks in my mind. Um, the other thing and the big one for me has always been if I'm not having fun. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're not having fun at work, you're probably in the wrong place. You know, I mean, what we do for a living is should be 
ridiculously fun mm -hmm. um, because you're using all the best parts of your creative being. It's all of the best, you know, I mean, we're helping humanity. We're doing work that we're passionate about, work that we love. We get to travel the world and produce mm -hmm. the greatest, you know, ideas. Um, so, you know, if you're not having fun, yeah. there's something wrong. Yeah. There's something wrong. So for me, it's always been learning and fun. I've literally never left a job because of money. I've mm -hmm. never, ever left a job to, to make more money. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, and I've never left a job to go work for a specific person either because that person could be gone three months from now mm -hmm. and then you're stuck at a shitty job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think it's sim very similar. You know, I, I think taking off the table um, what I think should be a given that you're not in a toxic workplace because then you should absolutely leave. Um, but if you're in a place where by all intents and purposes, you know, you're, you're on a team, you're supported. Um, I think you have to ask yourself, have I explored all of the opportunities available to me at this place, right? It's that chasing the opportunity mentality that I was talking about before. Sometimes, you know, we have, we have what, seven, eight, nine different teams in our organization. Yeah. Sometimes there might not be an opportunity on the team that you're on, but there might be a, a, an opportunity elsewhere. So I think exploring all of those to see if you can keep learning, if there's work that's going to challenge you and make you grow. Um, and then beyond that, there are times where you just, you kind of know like, all right, I've hit, I've hit as far as I'm going to go. I think it's time for something new yeah. so that I can keep challenging myself. Yeah. So I know we are pretty much at time right mm -hmm. now. So um, I want to thank you guys for joining. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact yep. me or Sam and we're happy to, to have to follow up. Um, but thank you guys so much.